Section 1. You will hear a conversation between Thomas and Nadia, who are waiting at the airport. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Where have you been, Nadia? Browsing in the bookshop. What took you so long? You said you were only going to be away five minutes. I was only gone for a quarter of an hour. Nadia said she was away for a quarter of an hour. So the correct answer is B, 15 minutes. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Where have you been, Nadia? Browsing in the bookshop. What took you so long? You said you were only going to be away five minutes. I was only gone for a quarter of an hour. Well, it seemed much longer than that. Did you buy anything? I was tempted to get the latest novel by Dan Brown, but it's quite heavy and I'd have to carry it around with me. If I could have found a crossword puzzle book, I'd have bought it. But in the end, I was attracted to a front-page article in today's issue of the New York Times. Is that all you bought, then? Yes. Look. Why don't you read the business section while I catch up on the news, and then we can swap? I'd rather have the entertainment section. Are you looking for anything in particular? I just thought they might have a review in there of that new play that opened on Broadway yesterday. The drama about the awfully cruel pirate? Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Hmm, I wonder how good it is. Actually, I was thinking of the new comedy... The one about the physician. Dr. Hunter. That's the one. Well, when I was in the bookshop, I overheard a couple talking about it, and they said it was fantastic, not in the least bit boring. They especially liked the actor who played the main part. Very smooth, apparently. Lots of fun, then. Well, according to those two, they thought it was hilarious. Ooh, we'll have to make a point of seeing it when we get back. Definitely. We didn't have time for breakfast and I'm hungry. Do you fancy a coffee and a muffin? Sounds like a good idea. And how will you have your coffee today? Long and black as usual. I think I might have something different this morning. What? You don't mean a flat white or some other milky one? Oh, I don't know. I want something to perk me up. An espresso, short and black with sugar. Perfect. Will that be with a chocolate muffin or a berry muffin? I'll try to stay off chocolate. The berry sounds healthier. And I'll have a plain one with butter. Won't be long. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Here you are. Mind the coffee. It's really hot. Thank you. I'm really ready for this. Have you thought about what we should see when we get to London? The Tower, of course. I've always wanted to get a look at the Crown Jewels. That is where they keep the jewels, isn't it? I think so. And what about the wheel? I hear it's quite extraordinary. I'm not that keen on the wheel. Do you want to ride on it? No way. Well, let's leave it out of the itinerary then. OK. So, do we do the tower first? Yes, that's the idea. And then we absolutely have to go to Westminster. Really? Yes. Look, it's not going to cost us anything. 
and I promised my sister I'd take photos there. Well, if you insist. I do. Oh, did you know the British Museum is free to the public? Not just residents, but tourists as well. Well, I did know that, but I was hoping we wouldn't have to spend time in any museums. We've only got three days in all, and it'll take at least one whole day to go through the museum. Well, let's say we leave it till day three and see how you feel then. OK. I can't argue with that. And Buckingham Palace? I suppose you've promised lots of photos of that as well, have you? Well, no, not really. But we can't say we've been to London and haven't seen the Queen's Palace. I guess not. And there's the added benefit that it won't cost anything as well. Oh, Thomas, it's not that I'm afraid of spending money. It's just that I want to see all the traditional sites first. Good. I'm glad that's sorted. Listen, I think they just called our flight. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a director of Hawkins, a large department store, giving an introductory talk to a group of temporary staff on their first day at the company. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 13. Hello everybody and welcome to Hawkins. I very much hope you will enjoy working here and indeed that some of you may take the opportunity to join our permanent staff. Now my purpose this morning is to give you a short overview of Hawkins and a few pointers about working here. Then I'll hand over to Celia, Head of Human Resources, to begin the training proper. Right, now we've seen quite a mixed history in sales recently at Hawkins. Five years ago, we saw the beginning of a success period as sales climbed at an exciting rate, but then they went flat again for a few years although we're delighted that they've recovered in the last year to rise again, so the future looks bright. As a company, we have to watch and be proactive about where these sales are coming from. All of you here will be allocated to different departments, but you may be interested to know where your area stands in relationship to others. Hawkins was traditionally basically a clothing retailer, and clothes remain an important part of our business, but over recent years we've seen that reduce as food and electrical have both grown, leaving us equally balanced on all fronts at the present time. This is a situation we'd be pleased to maintain, although the general increase in food spending is predicted to affect all major players in our sector. Well, that's us. What about you, as temporary staff? Where do you fit in? Any business that operates in a changing climate must rely heavily on contributions from a flexible proportion of its staff, and Hawkins is no exception. Last year, we recruited temporary staff into every department, and this year we've done that again, actually increasing the numbers, and we expect to take on an even higher proportion next year. So, you'll be playing an important part in our success. Before you hear the next part of the talk, 
You have some time to look at questions 14 to 19. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 19. We regard the Hawkins approach to the retail business as something special. Our mission statement, the guiding idea behind everything we do, is based on quality and is phrased creating value for customers. And this belief applies to every customer and every purchase, however large or small. Happy customers means good business for us, and your main aim must always be to keep customers happy. If any kind of problem or complaint arises, don't try to resolve it yourselves or simply leave it to a colleague, but get the assistance of your line manager. It's his or her responsibility to sort it out. A properly resolved problem will mean we get a loyal customer for life, and that's why we need to make sure that everyone who shops here feels they have had a positive experience, not just a routine transaction. We like to remind customers that everything we sell in Hawkins is high quality. It's the basis of our advertisements. But keep customers informed. Let them know about special offer products. To keep yourself up to date about these and all the other aspects of the company, Please look carefully through the newsletter that we publish each month. And something else you'll need to do regularly is to talk with your section supervisor, and you do this in your progress meetings, which will be every Thursday. OK? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at question 20. Now listen and answer question 20. Right, just a few things and then I'll hand over. I think you were all asked for details of your certificates when you filled in your initial application form. Can you make sure that you provide the Human Resources Office with copies of them by the end of the week? There's a pile of information videos on the table at the back there and I'd like you to take one each. And please make sure you watch it carefully when you get home this evening. It contains lots of important facts and advice. Will you also pick up your security pass by the end of the day from the office on the fourth floor, as you'll need it to get in tomorrow? Don't forget you'll need it to obtain your staff discount when you make any purchases. OK, that really is it from me. So now, Celia, if you'd like to take a... That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Dr Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people? Let's call them top achievers, successful. Yes. How are they different from us? 
What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it. But it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prized close friends and family life, and spent a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway, go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important, though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer. And only one third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Actually, in the end, they often have both, because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake, that certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive, who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hardworking people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright. She is so worried that she has missed something; she still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well. Top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we. Came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals, and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes. Loners, who are often over-concerned about rivals, can't delegate important work or decision making. Their performance is limited, 
because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job and learned something into the bargain too. Now there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecturer giving a talk on managing creativity in business. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello, everyone. The topic of today's management lecture is managing creativity in your business. And believe me, this is one of the toughest tasks that any manager has to face. How do you lead and control the staff whose job it is to create new business and product ideas for you? They are the ones full of creativity and imagination, so they need to have a lot of freedom. After all, they are the people who are paid to come up with new ideas. Controlling staff who are at the forefront of innovation will be one of your most challenging tasks. After all, creativity implies freedom of thought and action. Management styles used to be different especially in manufacturing. In the factory, staff would be told what to do and how to do it, with a watchful eye kept on them. In that setting, standardization was important for efficiency and product quality. Work could be exceptionally boring and there was no place for individuality. Now, of course, robots have taken over many of the exacting repetitive tasks. Nowadays, we employ far more people to generate business than to manufacture products. It's very competitive out there. Innovation. That's what our modern consumer craves. Successful companies have got the message. We need lots of new ideas. And now we employ bright young minds to come up with them. However, these ideas have to be implemented to make a change to our profits. So we have to find staff with entrepreneurial flair and be ready to listen to them and support them to follow through on their ideas. We need to supervise without stemming the flow of ideas or sending the brightest minds to work for the opposition. Creative people won't welcome us always looking over their shoulder and checking up on what they are doing. One of the most common ways that management handles this problem of keeping people working along company lines is by establishing achievement targets, like money earned, products developed, or clients gained. These targets are a useful guideline, but they have a downside. Young, enthusiastic staff will be very keen to meet these targets, and some of them might potentially use illegal means or behave unethically in order to meet requirements. For example, by offering bribes to gain sales, or making their sales numbers or earnings look higher than they are, or even threatening or criticizing other staff to get a job completed. Achievement targets are often linked directly to performance bonuses, and this can make a bad situation worse. So as you can see, the standard management techniques can create inherent problems both for the individual and for the company.
More recent theorists suggest new tactics for managers. Robert Simons, writing in the Harvard Business Review, has added some new concepts to the thorny problem of encouraging creativity while maintaining a viable business. He suggests three control levers to assist in getting positive creative contributions from the workforce. Remember, this is the point. We want creativity, wild, vibrant creativity to compete in the marketplace. Yet, we must be careful to keep people on track, sticking to our core business and maintaining the company's reputation. The first of his levers is getting the workers actively involved in the central ethos of the business. One of the most common ways to do this is to create a mission statement. But along with that, many businesses have some kind of motto, which summarizes their key idea. For example, the most durable tools in the world or perhaps the customer comes first. Whatever it is, you'll want your bright minds to believe it and act on it. So Robert Simons suggests that it should be developed with staff input, letting them feel like part of the operation. After all, their jobs depend on it. A second lever was once described by Charles Christensen, professor at Harvard Business School, as the power of negative thinking. You can't continually instruct your creative minds in what they should do. They are meant to be inventing, leading, not following. And telling them what to do is counterproductive. But you can tell them what not to do, which potential products are not related to the company's objectives, or which strategies or behaviors are unacceptable. This is a tactical ploy to maintain the company's integrity. It's absolutely vital to establish boundaries to assist in controlling innovation without suppressing it. The third lever is basically sitting down with your crew to share ideas about the business. As manager, your duty is to stay abreast of the external factors, such as who's competing in your market, how well is the company doing this month, and are you losing or gaining money? Is there some new product seducing your customers? This lever is called interactive control. This means you talk to your innovators and communicate honestly and clearly about your perceptions of what's happening in the market. You encourage them to share their ideas and make plans together for the future. That is the end of section four.